Welcome to Bandit's Keep. I'm Daniel. This week, we're going to talk about sandboxes. I think sandboxes and hex crawls might be some of the most popular things that you see people talk about here on YouTube. I'll join the party. So the thing I want to talk about, though, is not so much starting or prepping, because I think you get a lot of videos. In fact, I've done them, I'm pretty sure, on that. What I want to talk about is maintaining it. And part of this comes from a question I had from one of my players. We were we had played in a long Hyperborea campaign, and this wasn't exactly the, the same thing, but they said, you know, it was great how you were able to connect all these modules that weren't actually made to be run. It wasn't an adventure path. You just ran a bunch of modules and kind of connected them together so it seemed to make one complete story. And, you know, how did you do it? And I said, well, good players, right? And that's important, and that's definitely a good part of it. But there's other parts to it, and I'll talk about it right now. I'm running a full-on sandbox, so I thought it'd be easier to talk about that because I can show you what I'm actually doing. So some basic sandbox stuff before we start. If you don't already know this, when you're running a sandbox type where you're putting out lots of threads and lots of ideas, you want to do minimal detailing on these ideas until the party interacts with them. That is going to make your life so much easier. If you put a farm on the map, you might say, you know, that there's a farmer there and maybe that they're not a very nice person or that they have a family, but you don't need to get into deep backstory, how they're connected to other things, but you just want to have an idea of where stuff is. The other thing I like to do is have, I use, I'm playing original Dungeons and Dragons. I like to use the alignment system as kind of a, where do they stand? Not so much that they're chaotic evil or anything like that, but rather that where do they stand on my, on the teams, if you will? Are they more in favor of the chaos? Are they more in favor of the law? Or are they in the middle, meaning that they could be a mercenary that would work for either side, right? Or it could be that they just don't care. Maybe they're that farmer and they don't want to be involved in it. This is going to be important because that will help dictate without writing up a lot of detail how the people will interact with the player characters and what they're doing when you didn't plan for it. So again, I'm not going to go through a full prep thing, but I do want to, I said I said that, so let's just summarize. We're going to want to set up a lot of different locations and the pieces in movement. Think about two teams, let's say two armies, if you want to think about that, that both have a goal. They're doing stuff. And that's what's happening in the world. And all your adventures are going to spring from that. Eventually, the player characters will start to follow certain threads. Some of them they'll finish right away. But if it's a true sandbox, I know that uh, evil Jeff doesn't like that term, but if it's a sandbox, when this person is doing this thing over here, they're still part of the world, meaning that even if you stop this one bandit group from doing the thing they were doing, there's probably a reason why they were doing it. Yes, there are side quests, random things that happen. Some one loses something, you know, something falls in a well and they have to, you have to go fight giant rats or whatever. But in most cases, you want to have things at least somewhat loosely connected. So these bandits are robbing stuff from over here, but why are they doing that? Were they hired by somebody? Is it because they got driven out of a certain area or they're trying to move something over here? Is it because they're now allowed to do it because these people over here that used to stop them are no longer around because something's going on? These are the things that you want to think of in your mind. And you don't need to have everything like written out, but you want to have a little brief note. When the player characters interact with a storyline, I'll call it, and I know that OSR people don't like throw it story, but when they interact with that, that line, right, the farmer's, uh, cows are being stolen. So the player character is going to come up and figure out why. Well, when they interact with that, then we can start getting deeper. They're being stolen because the goblin army is forming on the other side of the forest and they are coming over and stealing cows to feed the army, right? But why is there a goblin army forming over there? Well, because there's a dragon that's commanding them or whatever, you know, so you can, you've got this like line. And how do we keep track of all this? I use two or three methods. So we're going to go into each of them one at a time. The first one is the simplest, which is a notebook. I want to take a second to thank my sponsor, Seppuku Sci-Fi. They've sponsored the channel many times before, and I thank you so much. Seppuku is a couple. They love sci-fi, and they show that love by making battle maps. They've got planets, spaceships, mechs, all kinds of fun stuff that you can throw on a VTT or, as I've said before myself, I use them on my iPad. On their Patreon, there's multiple tiers. The most common one is the $5 per map pack tier. They put out four or five different map packs a month with all kinds of variations. So you can get your base and then your like destroyed base or overwhelmed base, stuff like that. There's also a $10 per map pack tier where you get the animated maps. These are super fun to put on your VTT. If you're like me though, I throw them on my iPad. I take them to my face-to-face -face group. We kind of put it down on the table. You can put it on a TV as well, I guess. 
I've got a lot of these on my shelf, these kind of brown leather notebooks. I like them. They are dot grid. This is the current one for my current campaign. You can see stuff in there. Hopefully my players didn't see that. And what I'll do is I'll write up one or two pages, not per adventure, but per area. So if we look at this, for instance, here is my random sea encounters when they're on the sea. And here's the stuff that's, here is my random sea stuff. So when they go to the, the sea that they're in right now, I go to this page. It's on that page. I have it. Over here, I've got, that's actually for an adventure. Here's just rumors that they can be fed. Okay, and here I have, now we're getting into it. Here's an adventure location. So right next to it, I have all the reasons why things are the way they are. So this is basically just a really simple notebook, and it's not the most organized thing in the world. I do have to do a lot of flipping through it, but that's why I try to keep my notes simple. So what you want to do is have your basic idea for your location. Have your basic thing that's going on. And then as players interact with things and they learn things and you dig them up by improvising based on what makes sense in the world and other things that you know, you make brief notes. So as the player characters are interacting with me as a dungeon master and they ask me a question and they go, how many, uh, you know, they ask, they use their commune spell and they ask their, their god, how many hags are in the coven? Well, if I don't know that yet, I will make it up, roll for it, figure it out, and then I'll say six. I've read it in my notes. Because now I've told them the six hags in that coven, that needs to be the thing. So I make all these little notes. And then once the session ends, usually when I get home at night, I open my notes back up and I write more about it. This way, so again, brief notes as you're playing that get filled out in between. I don't spend a lot of time prepping before the game. I spend most of my prep time after the game. That is to say, I flesh out what the player characters interacted with. So if they continue that interaction... I'll know more. Another thing I've been using lately, th these are, uh, I'll put a link. This is from the face folio, these little cards with the faces on them. Uh, index cards with NPCs on them. You know, <laughs> early on when I got back into playing again, I was, I actually think I watched a YouTube video and somebody talked about keeping things on index cards in a box and everything. And I tried to do it for my campaign. And the first campaign I was running, it didn't work for me because I was mixing my media. I was doing the cards and I was also doing digital. And in the, for that one in particular, it worked out better. I kept everything on my phone. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second because I do it the same way. But so this didn't work for me. But now I'm doing everything, we'll call it analog. I'm enjoying embracing the game in a more analog style. So I use these so that I have a card. So if I, if I have an NPC, I've got a picture of them if I want them. And I have their stats. I can write things that are going on with them on the back. I can add notes. Everything's good to go. This person doesn't have much on them because they just discovered and rescued this wizard, elven wizard. And when we play next week, they'll have now have a card for them. The third piece of equipment I use, I use quite a bit. If you follow my other channel where I solo play, you've probably seen this. This is a uh, basically a week's calendar. So it keeps track of actual real time. So if you're doing a one-to-one -one style campaign, this is fantastic because it lets you know who's doing what, where, when, and how. And you can actually see in the back, I have cards from various NPCs. So this is what I use for my real-time campaign, my one-to-one -on -one -to -one time campaign, because I need to know it's September 3rd, right? In my other campaign, we don't do one-to-one. -one. For that, I track time just by every time we sit down in a session, I write down the date. And then depending on how many days go by, I mark it. I don't track time in between sessions for that campaign because it wouldn't add anything. Hopefully I won't get attacked by the one-to-one -one time must be had people. <laughs> but if you think that one-to-one -one time should always be the way, I guess let me know in the comments. All right, we've talked about some very high level stuff and I've shown you my tools. Now let's kind of dig into this a little bit. When we set up our campaign, our sandbox campaign, we start in a town. We take the Chicago Wiz idea of three hexes, right? We build a, a town hex, we build a couple of adventure sites, we put notices out. We let the player characters know there's stuff going on. They make choices. They go, you know what? It sounds interesting that there's a dungeon in the mountains. So we're going to go in that direction. So they're heading towards the mountains and your hex crawling and you roll randomly. They find a shrine. This shrine is occupied by lycanthropes. They can see the lycanthropes or let's say they see wolves prowling. They're a first level party. They're going somewhere else. They're thinking to themselves. Maybe they don't even know the lycanthropes. Maybe they see a few, you know, humanoids with them. But either way, they're thinking they're, this is not for us because we don't want to just fight wolves randomly. We don't know there's treasure here. We know there's a them over here. But we make a note. So now you know there's a shrine. You rolled that randomly. You don't know anything about it. If 
the player characters want to inter- interact with it right then and there, you'll have to do some improvisation. If not, you just write shrine occupied by lycanthropes where it is and you move on. You just leave it, you keep playing the game. If they start looking around, you can roll randomly, you can make things up based on your world, what makes sense, right? What you kind of already have in mind. And you'll, again, you'll jot down notes. If not, again, you leave it. They move on, they go to the dungeon, they explore the dungeon, they're doing different things in the dungeon, whatever. Now, session ends. You have notes of what happened through the session, but now you have this shrine and you're like, okay, there is a shrine with lycanthropes here. I know the party might eventually go to it. So let me make some minor notes. Number one, how many of them are there? Do they have treasure? Is this a dungeon or just a shrine? Who is the shrine to? Is there any other reason why the shrine might be important? And you might say no, or you might put a question mark there. Because maybe you don't want to say no. You might say no straight up and say this is definitely not important. I very rarely do that. I usually put a question mark, right? When I say not important, I mean it's basically just a place the characters can go to steal treasure from monsters versus something that could be connected to the world. So we put a question mark. We don't know now that's there. Now, a few sessions later, the player characters are higher level, or maybe, you you know, things are, the threads are starting to kind of go away that were originally cast and they haven't dug up too much new stuff. So they're in town and you now have somebody come and say, okay, there's wolves that have been attacking my flock of sheep and we shot them with arrows and it seemed to do nothing. So now the player characters are going to go, okay, those are probably lycanthropes. So maybe we can do something about this and hopefully they will (laughs) or not. Maybe they'll do something else. And eventually, if they don't do something about it, then maybe the more and more people will get killed and things will just keep escalating. If the player characters stay in town, they will see that. If they leave and go somewhere else, they won't. I mean, it won't matter, right? If let things carry on as they naturally would. Don't freeze the action of things because the player characters aren't interested right now. How do we do that? How do you do that? Well, solo. So I have another channel that's a solo role-playing channel, and this is not what I'm talking about. The solo role-play I'm talking about here is the idea of the story of the world, which, again, you create as the Dungeon Master, and you can use dice, going on when the player characters aren't interacting. So again, let's roll back to this scenario. They come back to town, they think they might be lycanthropes, but let's say they don't say anything. Maybe they're not strong enough to fight them now. Maybe they don't care. They leave it be. They travel off to another location that's a week away. So what could happen in the week? You sit down for a few minutes with your notebook and you go, well, these lycanthropes are attacking. What's likely to happen? Are there other people in the town that might organize to try to run the wolves out? Is that going to become a slaughter? Is there another venturing party that might actually take out the lycanthropes and become heroes? Do the farmers just move their flock and... We'll see what happens. You kind of think that out. What would be logical? What would happen here based on what's been going on? And once you do that, you just make that note. And the next time the players interact with that town, they will be able to get that information. In a sense, you want to do that for all the threads that are open. So when you're sitting down to think about your game, you know, you you fill out your notes a little bit. You just take a few minutes. And there's different ways of playing and different people love different things. You might be the person that has spreadsheets and this and that and maps and deep histories. Cool. But that's not required. So let me roll all the ways back to my first ongoing large campaign as an adult. When I got back into playing, it was in 5th edition, and it was an open world sandbox. How did I keep track of it? I was actually using my phone. As it turned out, I had kind of a long train commute. So I would finish the game, and then I would sit down with my phone, and I actually had the name of each of the NPCs that they would interact with, you know, not a minor one that they bought a soda from, but the major people they were actually doing stuff, or I'd write like Thieves Guild or, you know, Mountain Trolls. And each time I'd sit down, I would look at, have the session, I would sit down and I would make a note, i put the date, and I'd copy and paste, and I would put all the people in again and I would say, Mountain Trolls. Okay, well, it's been two weeks. What have happened with them? Well, nobody's bothered them. They're probably just still doing the same thing. I leave it. Uh, Thieves Guild. Okay, they've been recruiting people. Did they recruit anybody? Maybe I rolled some dice. Thieves Guild has managed to recruit five more people. Uh, you know, evil paladins that are looking for the the stone to charm the devil, whatever. I, I can't remember what's going on. <laughs> you know, uh, what did they do? And I, I think about it. I might roll. I might just make it happen if it makes sense for it to happen. And I just kept track of each person. Each It's not that hard to do. You just look at your list and you go. And a lot of people, 
after a while weren't super important anymore. So I would just not copy them, right? Because they haven't been in that part of the world forever. If they go back and they go, oh, you know what? We want to travel by airship to this other part of the world to see that wizard that we met when we were third level and now we're seventh level. You know, we're going to do that. Then you've got to be like, okay, let me go back. Look at that wizard, see what they were working on, what was going on, what else has been going on in the world. And you just narrate forward. And there it is. Because you already have a baseline, you know that you won't make the wizard suddenly evil when they were good or something like that. But you also are bumbling when they were super intelligent. But you, you know, they haven't seen that person in months and months or even years. So you can make lots of changes. Maybe they've brought in apprentices. Maybe they built a castle. All those things could happen. And you could just put that in your notes. Almost like you're making a brand new NPC. So I personally have found that these kind of sandboxes work best when you don't do the epic fantasy, there's a single big bad that we have to destroy. It's usually better if there is more of a lingering menace. And that lingering menace could eventually lead to a singular figure that needs to be defeated in order to destroy that thing. But what you don't want to happen is they go and they start down one thread and this idea in your head is, well, this person is going to destroy the world in six months if the player characters do something. And they decide to just go somewhere else. And the next person's going to destroy the world in seven months. And that person's going to destroy the world in two months. It's like well, all these people are destroying the world and nobody's succeeding, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> why do we even need the player characters? You need to make things take their natural end, which means that you can't create a lot of villains that are constantly destroying the world. They've got to be a little more localized. But remember I talked about at the beginning, the sides thing. You can have this building evil or I guess or chaos or building law if you want to play the other side of it that's coming in and overpowering, and you see signs of it throughout. These things, going back to what I said, the reason the Goblin Army is forming, the reason why the men-in-arms are now making people stay in at night, these are the symptoms to the bigger problem, and that problem might not be something that gets solved with a single sword thrust. It might be more like you're living in a world doing your best to keep the world safe for people like you. Like you, meaning they have the same beliefs as you, law, chaos, or maybe even neutrality. You just want to be safe in this area and you'll do what you can to keep those forces away from a place where you consider home. One final thing I'll say here is this should be fun. There's lots of stuff that, that bounces around about it being, oh, it's so hard to do this or it's this, this, and I'm not enjoying it. You can run games in any fashion you like. There is no ideal. There is no perfect game, no matter what people will try to tell you. Run something that you enjoy running and your players will like it. And if some players don't like it, they'll move on and other players will come in. Eventually, you'll get a nice tight group that likes a certain style and you can all play together and have fun. You don't need to have a certain kind of thing. You don't need rising tension and plots and big bads. You don't need sandboxes and open worlds. What you need is what makes you and your group happy. So I hope this was helpful. Let me know in the comments below. Also, check the description for a link to a sip -a -coup. Also, there's a link down there to my Discord server and also to my Patreon if you want to support the channel. I'll talk to you soon.